to adjust your cushions right here. You need to adjust that? It's a little higher? Hello, everyone. So my name is Audrey Van Genecht and I work for the New York State Department of Health. So we're going to take a public health dive right now. Um, about eating Hudson River fish. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our Hudson River Advisory Outreach Program. Um, and also, why, why are we so focused on strike the ass anglers and getting the word out to them? And about what does, what does the data show? Um, and the caveat is that, again, this is the public health and data perspective. Um, I'm certainly not a fisheries biologist, and I'm absolutely not a toxicologist. <laughs> Um, so our project runs 192 miles from Hudson Falls in Washington County all the way down to New York City. And the goal is that everyone fishing the Hudson knows, understands, and follows our advice. It, it's no big deal. No big deal. Um, we offer a range of written materials in many different languages. Uh, and we work with a lot of community partners and we also do a lot of in-person outreach at events up and down the river. Um, so, we have at this point collected about 1,300 consumption surveys, and these are not statistical, um, you know, samples. This is essentially just anglers who are coming up to us um, at events who are talking with us. Uh, we ask them, you fish on the Hudson? They're like, yes. We're like, do you want to take our survey? By the way, if anyone here fishes on the Hudson and wants to take our survey, <laughs> come see us at the poster session. You can get a straight bass bag. Um, so, yeah. And it's a short survey, I promise, it's a short survey. <laughs> so these, these consumption uh, surveys, they help us target our program. Uh, it lets us know if there's certain locations that seem to have higher consumption rates, and it also allows us to see what the top species are that people want to eat. Uh, about 42% of people say that they never eat anything from the Hudson. They're just doing catch and release. But then another 42% of people are eating fish at least a few times a year. And the, the difference is the people who are eating it more than a few times a year. Um, so here's the Hudson River. Um, I don't know if this thing has a laser pointer, so I brought my own. Um, so here is uh, here's Hudson Falls and Fort Edward. This is where the original contamination happened. Uh, this upper Hudson section is a catch and release only section. It's take no fish, eat no fish. You can get a ticket if DEC catches you taking fish home. Um, the Mid-Hudson, Regina and I hail from Albany. Um, the Mid-Hudson has, it's a strict advisor, I'm not gonna lie. There's really only four fish that we recommend men and older women eat. Children and, and younger women, uh, women of, of childbearing years should really not be eating anything at all from the Hudson. I want to point out, unfortunately, the conspicuous absence of what everybody wants to be eating from the Hudson. So we have, we have a don't eat advisory between Troy and Catskill. And that is also, as uh, somebody mentioned earlier, it's, um, the river is tidal all the way up to, to the federal dam. Above that, um, it's just a fresh water river, essentially. Um, South of Catskill, it's really a different, a different situation. There's a lot more fish that men and older women can eat. They can eat striped bass, um, and there's, there's certain ones that are, are bad, bad news. Catfish in general are usually bad news. Any place where there's PCB contamination, which is what is the issue uh, in the river. So of the people who say are eating it, more than 75% of people are saying that they're eating striped bass. 
And a lot of those people are eating south of Catskill. They'll, they'll say, you know, we're only eating it a couple times a year. It's for those, for those folks, they're well within the advisory. Um, however, there are also a lot of people that really don't follow our advisory. They're fishing between Troy and Catskill almost exclusively. And they, they really do consider the fish, uh, striped bass, ocean fish. People know striped bass are nadromous. And it, it works against us in that they don't think that the advisories apply to striped bass. Um, when we first were doing our survey, we actually had to change the questions to say, including striped bass in every single one of the consumption questions, because people would say, I never eat it, I never, I never eat it. And then they would pencil in on the margins, uh, striped bass are ocean fish. Like, um, so the other thing too to point out, because striped bass is, is a, it's a cultural institution in the Hudson Valley. And unlike other, other fish that are quote unquote are don't eat like catfish or even walleye, um, where fishermen who, who do want those uh, fish to take home, there's no other waters in most of the Hudson Valley that they can get to to catch striped bass. It's the Hudson River. Um, you can go out to New York City, but people who are living near Troy, you know, that's not really a realistic option. So it turns out, after all of these years going out to these events, we, we realized that uh, striped bass anglers are really a breed of their own. Um, we quickly learned that we needed a little something extra to be able to, to open up a conversation and essentially convince people that uh, most striped bass, yes, are ocean fish, but they should really consider following our advisories. Um, so this graph is from the Interstate Work Group. Um, it's, it's a little bit old, but it's still very relevant. You have average PCB levels in parts per billion. Everything else in this presentation will be parts per million, by the way. So this is in parts per billion, and you have different locations along the bottom. In this gray box, it shows the average PCB levels in the Hudson River, essentially comparing other East Coast rivers. Here is 2005 and 2006 um, between the city and Poughkeepsie. Here's 2005 and 2006 in the spring in Troy. And here are your fall levels in Troy. Now, lower in the river, where people can eat up to a meal a month of striped bass, it, it's comparable to some of these other places. However, it's almost double by the time you get to Troy, even in the spring. So what do the numbers look like now? They really haven't changed that much. Um, talking with anglers through these graphs, uh, we found them very, very useful. And so some people were pointing out, oh, well, that, that data is pretty old. So we updated it. Um, this is 2007 through 2015. Average PCB levels, again, in striped bass. Here on your uh, y-axis is PCBs in part per million. Again, you see just this tremendous, there's a lot of variability in general year to year, but you see very high averages, again, in Troy. One thing to point out is that this does include the dredging years. A lot of folks have questions about whether or not the levels were really raised in the lower river, especially because of the dredging. Dredging in that upper Hudson section, so between Hudson Falls and really Waterford, so not even down to Troy, happened in 2009, there was a gap year in 2010, and then wrapped up between 2011 and 2015. Um, and really, there hasn't been any changes that have, see, have, have been seen. The, the, the rate of change is very close to zero. However, with this graph, it's useful, but averages can also hide some of the variability that is inherent in some of these fish. The next iteration of what we've been calling the straight bass packet uh, takes in, this into account and it helps to show anglers uh, some of this, this variability. So each one of these bars represents the PCBs in one fish that was sampled. Um, you have PCBs in parts per million, again on the Y, and you have the different locations, Troy in the fall, Troy in the spring, and then Catskill South along the X axis. 2015 happened to be a little bit of a lower year. Um, usually there's more spikes in the Troy Spring data, but overall, I mean, there's, there's just variability year to year. And these individual PCB graphs have really um, been effective in helping to convince anglers 
of this, this phenomena that we're seeing around this area. And uh, to, for lack of a better term, essentially the variability really does highlight what we've been calling the striped bass Russian roulette. Uh, you have very, very low fish mixing in with these very, very high fish. And this happens year after year after year. So there's, there's many factors that go into setting um, the New York State Department of Health's fish advisories. Um, they use a, a risk management approach versus a straight risk assessment approach. And we'll, we will be at the poster session. Like I said, I'm not a toxicologist, but if you have some general questions, I can answer those later. Um, but you know, when you're looking at, at graphs with numbers, you, you do need some sort of a reference point. So one and two parts per million for PCBs are the ones that you really need to consider. Um, above one part per million, we really start saying women and kids should not be eating any fish at all. And there starts to be these advisories for a meal a month for men and older women. Above two parts per million, and this is also the FDA federal standard, we say no one should be eating it. That, that's just a don't eat at that point. Um, and so this, this graph is from 2013, and you'll see this graph again in, in a second. So here's that same graph for Catskill South. And you see the variability uh, decreases dramatically. You have much fewer spikes. I mean, most of these fish are below 2 ppm, and mo you know, the majority of them are even below 1 ppm. So if you plan on eating your fish, please go south of Catskill. <laughs> Um, so here's, here's two more years again. This is 2011 and here's 2013. Again, same, same scale. This goes up to eight parts per million on both of these. Uh, Troy Fall all the way to the left with Troy Spring and then Catskill Down, same for both. Um, and each bar uh, represents the PCB levels in an individual fish. So what are your chances out of 10? Uh, well, in 2011, it happened to be 100%. Troy fall. Now most people aren't fishing in the fall in Troy, but these fish do stick around and you're seeing some of that in these Troy spring numbers. Um, and you really, you, you see these peaks and these valleys of just the, the, the great variation that you have right between striped bass and people could, could be fishing, you know, right into this, this pool and you can't tell. You have, you have no idea what you're actually catching. I'll just mention that 2011 was also a very eventful weather year. There, were, there was flooding um, in the spring, and then we ended up with uh, Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee in the fall. So 2011 was definitely a little bit of a higher year, but there was a lot of variation in, in the weather. Okay, moving to biological for a second. Uh, these slides are from, from Jess Best over there. Um, so this is uh, Hudson River striped bass spawning stock. So here is percent on the Y, and this is length along the X. And so the Hudson River striped bass population, uh, by, by nature, it has a, a skew in um, the, the males and the females. And Jess, correct me if I'm wrong, the males come in sooner, um, they start reproducing sooner, and the females wait a little bit before they start to come in. Um, the previous regulation allowed one fish above 18 inches to be kept and then because they had to reduce the stock, uh, the, the landings. So a new regulation was put into place to try to protect this big spawning sp stock of females. Um, so this went into effect in 2015, is that right? And essentially it pushed anglers toward the, the smaller males within the stock. So how does this play out with PCB levels? So here's Catskill. We have total PCBs again on this y-axis. This is length now on the bottom in inches. I can't do millimeters, I'm sorry guys. <laughs> uh, so uh, you, the blue dots represent the total PCB levels in male striped bass. Uh, the red squares are female striped bass. And here's your 2 ppm just as a reference point as we go through these graphs. So again, Catskill, you can keep, um, or we say, you know, eat up to a meal a month for men and older women. Most of these fish are looking pretty good. They're, they're below that 2 ppm, and most of them are below 1 ppm. So these are the ones that you can keep, 18 to 28 inches. And then here's, your, here's the, th the throwback, here's the slot limit, 28 to 40, you got to put back. So um, now for the unintended consequence that I had alluded to. Uh, so here's fall. <coughs> 
or here's Troy in the spring, sorry. Um, and you see that you start to have that, those high PCB fish really mixing into this, this spawning stock that you know, we're, we're targeting, targeting 18 to 28 inches, even though these guys are really the ones that are very, very low PCBs. And I mean, uh, Dr. David Secor has seen some of this play out in some of his otolith studies. Um, typically males had a homing tendency for freshwater habitats. Um, and when those fish were sampled, they ended up coming back quite high in PCBs. Um, so, I'm not a statistician, but here's some, some box plots. So this is uh, three years, 2015, 13, and 11, Troy Springs striped bass. Uh, so here's total PCBs, and this is by slot limit length versus the PCB concentrations. Is there a difference? It looks like a difference. Now remember, this is a don't eat advisory. So we know though that there are people that are eating these fish. So this is sort of this unintended consequence of the keeping the smaller fish is essentially pushing anglers into higher PCB fish in places where they really aren't supposed to be eating any at all. So what about those fall striped bass that the DEC nets in, in September and October? Uh, here's Troy Fall, same type of graph. You see very, very high PCBs because these are essentially the fish that are just staying in, in the riverine system. Even when they're not up by Troy, when they go back down, they're staying in Haverstraw Bay, they're staying near the New York Harbor. They're never really leaving a system that doesn't have some sort of PCB influence on them. And dare I say, contingent? <laughs> Um, so what about something that people can eat all up and down the river? Yellow perch. Uh, so here's the same types of graphs. This go up to five parts per million. Here's length. This is Troy Spring, uh, Catskill Spring. Well under two, well under one for the most part. How about one of our bad boys? Just as a comparison. Please don't eat the catfish. <laughs> Not good. So how far have we come? Well. Uh, on all these other individual fish graphs, the, the y-axis went up to 8. This is 50. Uh, this is a snapshot of past levels, uh, spring and fall of 1986. It's spring unless otherwise noted along the locations in the bottom here. PCB levels in striped bass have declined dramatically. Um, the production of PCBs and use by the factories ended in 1977, and the PCBs were banned in 1979. Uh, and the first fish advisories for the Hudson River were actually issued in 1975. So the scale really says it all on this one. And moving forward, uh, this is a graph that uh, Kevin Farrar in our remediation, uh, DEC Remediation Bureau supplied. This is just a, the, the trend of total, total PCBs in, in spring striped bass from 1973 all the way to 2015, and it includes locations between the GW in New York City all the way to Troy. Um, Section-specific advisories really still need um, to be in place. As you guys saw, there's some, some stuff happening between Troy and Catskill that's really uh, something that we all need to continue considering. Uh, you know, our data, we couldn't do our advisories without all the work of the DEC, uh, without Wayne and Jesse and Kristen and the whole Region 3 uh, folks that go out on the river to collect these fish. So close coordination continues at the state level. And also the EPA, DEC, and DOH continue to work together to understand the dynamics and what's going on with the PCB levels in the lower river. Thank you.